Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming. Welcome to CSENT Conversations, presented by the Center for Security, Innovation, and New Technology at American University. I'm Nicholas Davis, and I'm a graduate student here at the School of International Service at AU, and I'm excited to kick off today's edition of CSENT Conversations. Joining us today to discuss his important, thought-provoking, and entertaining book, Messing with the Enemy, is Mr. Clint Watts. His book provides a roadmap of the biggest online terrorist, disinformation, and Russian active measures threats facing the United States today. Mr. Watts has served as a US Army infantry officer, an FBI special agent, an analyst supporting US Special Operations Command and the intelligence community, as well as a consultant to the National Security Branch at the FBI. Currently, Mr. Watts is a distinguished research fellow at FPRI, and he's a non-resident fellow at the Alliance for Securing Democracy at the German Marshall Fund. He focuses on social media influence, Russian active measures, counterterrorism, and terrorism. His background in analyzing terrorism networks makes him especially well positioned to understand Russian propaganda operations. Mr. Watts is also a frequent guest writer and analyst for multiple media sources, such as CNN, MSNBC, and War on the Rocks. Welcome, Mr. Watts, and thank you for joining us to discuss Messing with the Enemy today. Additionally, Hosting our discussion is Audrey Kurth Cronin, Distinguished Professor of International Security and the Founding Director of the Center for Security, Innovation, and New Technology. Over to you, Professor Cronin. Let's get this started. Great. Thank you, Nicholas. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, uh, Clint. We're delighted to have you at the center, and um, I'm also delighted that you've given us permission to record this uh, conversation because uh, I know that a lot of people like to watch it afterwards on our website. Um, I'm a big fan of your work, Clint. Uh, have been following it for a long time since, uh, well, before you joined uh, or were working with the CTC at West Point. I was one of the big users of the Harmony database and a lot of the publications, the um, map of what was it called, militant ideology. Okay. That was really helpful. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, super work, fabulous work, really important to uh, those of us who are trying to get a better understanding inside groups and um, understand the dynamics and not just kind of read the usual second and third level um, academic research that a lot of people kind of quote to each other. So um, I, I'm a huge fan of all the work that you've been doing. I also love your book, uh, Messing with the Enemy. And here is the cover, everybody. Uh, and you'll see that it's loaded with little flags on my part. Um, I think it's a fabulous book. And we're going to hear about it more in uh, just about the next uh, 90 minutes. So here's how this is going to work. Uh, Clint, I would like to ask you to start out by giving us an overview for some 30 or 40 minutes talking about the key points. I think it's a great book, has such wide range. I, I can only imagine how hard it must be to choose some of the stories and some of the aspects of the book because I, I just find myself getting lost in it. So anyway, we'll give you the floor for a while. Then I'll ask you a few questions, and then uh, we may go back to Nicholas and also to the Q&A box. And those of you who are watching, please go ahead and post your questions as we go along, uh, and I'll try to get to as many as we can, and we will end at 12.30. So again, welcome, Clint, and uh, the floor is yours. All right. Uh, thanks, Audrey. So thrilled to be here today. You know, Audrey, wrote a great book herself, which uh, my team, which is some of my team, which has been in this garage, which I'm in right now, all the way up until August, we had it upstairs and we take turns uh, reading it. And so fantastic to be here today. Uh, you guys are definitely going in the right direction too, in terms of technology and how it affects national security. I, I think it's like the future. It, it, if I could recommend any uh, direction to go, it would be that. And obviously I'm biased because it's what I work in, but I think it's super important. And uh, I think that's probably where I'll start off, which is um, 2005 or six. So interestingly enough, um, there was a period right after 9-11 where everyone was sort of fixated on Al Qaeda. And if we just chased them down in Afghanistan and Pakistan, the problem would solve itself. Then we invaded Iraq to give them the opportunity to regenerate for some reason. Now, looking back, it's kind of a, the irony uh, of national security. Security. But beyond that, uh, Al Qaeda's refuge, at least it was thought in those early days, um, was the internet. And there was a whole period right about 2005 where uh, Al Qaeda migrated even further to the internet. They had been on bulletin boards and things like that. 
um, but they were moving very quickly into the space because it was a communications platform that was relatively unpoliced, that was openly accessible to a degree. And if you had access to the internet, well, then you could still continue on. You could plan and plot, you could coordinate, you could communicate. So that was unheard of to extremists. And there was a, there's a great section in Larry Wright's book uh, called The Looming Tower, where he talks about, uh, I believe the man was in Kansas City and he wanted to go join the Mujahideen and he had to find actual tapes to listen to and then make his way all the way to Pakistan. And by 2005 or six, that process uh, had been shrunk to a couple days, thanks to the internet. I, you know, it it went from months long journey and commitment to go join the Mujahideen in, in the Afghan mountains to I can get to Iraq in two or three days if I so choose. And, and I remember we were doing these kind of ridiculous studies in the earliest days, and they were like, how, you know, how are uh, Al Qaeda and ISIS infiltrating into Syria? And I was like, well, they went to you know, Travelocity and they bought an airplane ticket to Turkey and then they walked across the border. That was like a whole study we did, which anyone could have told you if you, if you wanted to figure out how to get there, that's how you get there. And that's because the internet was bringing everybody and all services together. Uh, probably about 2006, I want to say it was, I was at the Combating Terrorism Center at West Point and we had students who were studying um, Al-Qaeda and ISIS and, or Al-Qaeda at the time, Al-Qaeda in Iraq principally, and he was tracking uh, Al Qaeda sniper videos on YouTube and putting them together to such a point where we knew different types of shooters in different locations. Uh, we could tell who they were targeting and what part of Iraq they were in. And so this was kind of the dawn of OSINT or open source intelligence that you started to see unfold. And we were running projects with students and it was, we weren't the only ones. We learned that there were lots of people around the world doing it. One of them who I mentioned a lot in the book is Andrew Weisberg. He was doing it from his couch in a house in Illinois. and was just like a freelance sort of guy. There's other ones named Evan Coleman that you might hear of or see on NBC. He was doing a lot of that. Will McCants, who I worked with and did the Militant Ideology Atlas uh, project that we used at the Combating Terrorism Center. So this was sort of the, the dawn of a whole new era, era of OSINT. And now you see this after January 6th, the insurrection. There's like everyone's a open source investigator and hunter. And so this has been an explosion. But separately, you saw a shift in terms of how both extremists uh, were using uh, the internet and others were going to use the internet, which was two-way communication. And that's social media. And ultimately, it empowered populists. And I think that's why in the book, I try and tell that saga. Um, you know, open doors open, portals open, portals close, groups close. Yeah, it's this kind of like enduring cycle. And the most nimble actors, you know, go there first for survival. Uh, Al-Qaeda went to the internet for survival. Uh, ISIS, uh, it's, its upstarts went to social media for survival. But then over time in the trajectory I try and lay out in the book is those with the most resources, the most commitment, the most manpower and the most tech over time overtake that sort of populist mobilization. And so one way to think about it and I'll start with Al-Qaeda and ISIS is Al-Qaeda um, was actually an elite cadre known as the base. The whole reason they developed it was to indoctrinate people ideologically and train people militarily so that they could infiltrate all of these Islamic movements around the world and fight on their behalf and essentially create the opportunity that would be developing a caliphate. ISIS is just populist jihadism that's essentially what it was in its infancy you know is in, in its infancy and then in terms of what it achieved um it is the same as the arab spring and it should be no coincidence that people see how technology sort of opens these doors and it has good and bad sort of components it just depends on who the actors are that are using it um i'll come back to the arab spring because that's really chapter two three into four and how i come onto the russians so the Arab Spring, which was, I think, exactly 10 years ago right now, someone was writing an article, I think yesterday, and that's when everybody thought Facebook and Twitter had saved the world, remember this point, because it all sort of unravels over time. Um, but the Arab Spring was nothing more than populists being empowered by technology, uniting audiences together in such a way that they could pick certain objectives they wanted to achieve, and they could physically mobilize on the real world. And that's what you saw from Tunisia 
Cairo, you know, the protests that people know or remember the best, Libya, which essentially just completely broke down from it, and then Yemen, and the last one that sort of was unfolding and is still just about to end is Syria. And so we'll come to that in a moment. But that phenomenon of populists coming together to achieve an immediate objective um, was pretty powerful. And if you're familiar with Malcolm Gladwell, he wrote a, a very timely and excellent article that everyone hated him for it in about 2011 or 12. And it said, the revolution will not be tweeted. And it was prescient because he compared it to mobilizations, protest, and, and government change essentially during the 1960s uh, civil rights era. And it was that it's not just simply enough to have these weak connections. You can actually get to some sort of point, which is like overthrowing a regime, but then it leaves the open question of who's in charge. I would like to also note the Occupy movement was hugely uh, impactful about 2012, same thing, populists coming together, but there's a Stephen Colbert skit, if you ever get a chance to watch, where he interviews people in the Occupy movement and ask him who, who's in charge. And they all say, no one's in charge. It's flat. He goes, well, then I'm going to be in charge. And he challenges them. They said, no, you can't be in charge. He says, but why can't I be in charge? So it's just remarkable how this tumult was happening, like amongst it, all of these different movements at about the same time. And that was enabled by the technology, which is social media. And it would essentially unravel in several different ways. And so the, one of the one of the 10, when I went to write this book, I had 10 thesis that I individually put into chapters. And the big overarching was is the internet brought everybody together and social media tears everybody apart. And that's because of the dynamics and the change of the filtering system of the technology. And that happens literally over a 20 year period. The first 10 years is Kumbaya, let's buy everybody a Coke, that's the internet. And then social media, which is we can all talk back and we can interact and now we can overcome the filter and that social media, and we're at this third decade now, uh, which is going to be super crazy, is actually going to be my follow-up book, which I'll tell you about at the end, but I probably will just write it on Substack because I'll get too lazy. But separate from that, the dynamic I want to explain is you could see this art coming, and I think for us that we're tracking terrorists, there was immediate concern. I want to talk 2011 to 12. You saw this breakdown period where several things happened in the physical world and several things happened in the virtual world. So in the virtual, the physical, it was the Arab Spring, which toppled all of these regimes. And that's really chapter two of the book and chapter three. You know, And, and so you could see this happening. Separately, bin Laden is killed. Uh, where Aliki is killed and sort of the traditional structures of jihadism start to break down. And when you start to look for a clerical authority over time, you'd seen a dilution of that where lots of ideologues in the jihadist space weren't really experts. That was the whole point of bin Laden. If you went to a jihadi ideologue in the 1990s, they'd be like, well, Sam bin Laden is like the kid of a construction magnate. I don't know why we're listening to him. So this is one of the themes that will play out through the book. It started a lot with jihadists, but now it happens in our own American politics. It's a weird phenomenon that happens, which is this dilution of expertise and authority over time as people become empowered. Empowerment is great. Empowerment can also be dangerous depending on how the, the systems and the levers, you know, the challenge at work. So in that 2011-12 time period, it's kind of that vacuum, and it reminds me of uh, the era after the Soviet Union collapsed in the Cold War, where the, the U.S. is like trying to figure out its place in the world, and everyone's going to have democracy, and we did a lot of that same, you know, it's 20 years later, it's 2011, 12, we're like, oh, it's the same, everyone will be democratic, you know, everybody gets a McDonald's, and we all buy cheeseburgers, and it's great. That's kind of the, you know, very summarized version of American philosophy on these things, but subsurface, that was not correct. Uh, Whenever you have a vacuum, those that come into place and oftentimes gain control are those that understand the levers of power. And power is part about money, but it's mostly about information. And this is what you see shift. Al-Qaeda in Iraq, which became the Islamic State in Iraq, was already moving away from uh, Al-Qaeda's structure. Why did they do that? Because they didn't know bin Laden. They were the second generation of jihad. They fought in Iraq and Afghanistan in the 2000s, not in the 1990s. They didn't physically know bin Laden or Zawahiri. He was just someone on a screen. And so you start to have generational divergence. 
And that generational divergence is empowered and grows and the ranks swell because of social media. They could connect with audiences worldwide. They could do videos, they could do audio. You could have Anwar Aliki quickly move up where they're talking about replacing Bin Laden with Aliki. And I'm sure Bin Laden was like, it took me 30 years to get here. He's not gonna replace me in two. This sort of infighting was mostly generational. And so what you saw is if you were in these spaces, you could start talking with a lot of these jihadists. And that's chapter three in the book, which is about Omar Hamami, which is, this was not like some secret covert discussion. You could just put out things about them. And because jihadists are narcissists, as are most social media populists over time, um, because they are narcissists, they will try and correct you or talk back to you. And so that's where we really just started using FBI basic 101 interview techniques. And I would just write blog posts about them um, with open questions about things I didn't know. And he, he would answer me back almost within an hour and he's in Somalia. He would be reading what I'm writing in Boston at the time. And it shows that interconnectivity uh, of troll counter trolling, these sorts of things that now are just like everyday life on Twitter, but you could see this sort of dynamic happening. The other part is you could see uh, arguments amongst each other. This is open discussion. Al Qaeda was about closed forms, the new ISIS breed that was emerging and Somalia was really one of the first places uh, that this was happening. That new ISIS strain was essentially populist. They wanted to tell everybody about what they were doing. For them, it was uh, about notoriety. As soon as you got to Syria, you would take a picture of yourself and leave your beacon on to let everybody know that you made it to Syria. This is more about violence and less about ideology. Ideology comes later. This sort of change was obvious, I think, if you were watching in these jihadist spaces. And by 2013 to 14, you could see that they were going to go in wildly different directions. They were disobeying bin Laden, if they heard from him at all. Then came Zawahiri. They didn't like him. He was kind of the grumpy, you know, the grumpy grandfather of Al Qaeda. And he just was never, never very personable or, or inspiring in the way that bin Laden was. While all of this is going on, what, what you see behind the scenes is what is essentially nation state actors. And nation state actors saw this phenomenon of populism and they were not gonna let it happen. When I'm saying nation states, I'm talking about authoritarians. And Syria became the test ground for a lot of this. Um, Syria was where jihad was spilling out of control. America couldn't control it. It couldn't be really coalesced into a open, you know, overtaking of Assad. Uh, and there were many stakeholders there, as opposed to like Libya, where there were stakeholders, but those that nation has always been a nation of many tribes. In Syria, it was Assad versus Assad's opponents. And there were jihadists in there. There was the Free Syrian Army in there. People were trying to figure out what the stew was and around it circle all the way around is every country in the Middle East, which had interest in Syria to include Russia. And that's where you saw things come to play. So in chapters four uh, and kind of working into five, uh, four is really about what you could see coming. And we stumbled onto the Russians in Syria, which was their second social media campaign. And I'll actually show you a quick uh, slide group there. Important to know with authoritarian regimes, whenever they do these things, if they're successful, is they almost always do it on their own domestic population first. And so the Soviet Union, when it collapsed and became Russia, uh, they really struggled for about a decade to figure out what to do with information. And you'll remember back to, to if you remember back to Gorbachev and what they were doing, they were opening up both financially, they were opening up in terms of information. And this chaotic stew led to a big vacuum. And when there's vacuum, people control money, and people control information. And if you can control both, then you're enormously powerful. And so there were people uh, that really rose to power that were significant over time, Vladimir Putin being the obvious one. But behind the scenes was what a concept known as managed democracy, which is essentially, okay, if you can't control everything, you should infiltrate everything and be the puppet master of essentially all the parties and actors. If you can read anybody you know, that's out there in the world, uh, Surkov is the one that I always read. I see him as my personal adversary in terms of work that I do. But he was a Russian propagandist, essentially, a brilliant one, and probably the most brilliant in the world. And at the time, he was starting to understand, OK, I need to infiltrate television. I need to be able to control the internet. We need to be able to control political parties. 
We need to have our hands in all of the financial resources that are out there. And he understood more than anything, the power of information. And so this is really where I think the, the other thesis of the book is the only thing worse than no information is too much information. That's essentially America today, by the way, the chaotic stew that bombards your social media feeds every day. And he understood that if you flood uh, the, the audience with information, they become confused. When they become confused, um, you can start to manage their perceptions over time by playing to their natural biases. And for that approach, social media is a doomsday weapon. I'm convinced that the Russians saw what happened in, in Tahrir Square and across the Arab Spring and said, can you believe that these giant audiences came together without knowing each other and with no one in charge and actually overthrew a government? What if we could do that, except we are the puppet masters behind the scenes and we're using this information advantage uh, to build our own system? You saw this essentially inside Russia. It was going, you know, it was occurring for a long, long time. Separately, you saw it going to Ukraine. And just something to kind of remember, you know, Ukraine is to Russia what Taiwan is to China. This is where you go. Why do you go there? There's a diaspora population. That gives you a natural sort of audience to build upon. Why do you go there? It's your near abroad. It, it's someplace very close to home that you want to really focus on. Why do you go there? Lang linguistically, it's easier to do. It's easier to program in Russian than it is to program in English or any other uh, language around the world. So it's about capacity. It's about testing things out. And ultimately, it, it's about understanding how to get into an audience and start to infiltrate and then essentially influence over time. And Syria was the next and logical extension of it. So what I'll do is I do have, uh, there's a story I told in the book, um, which is about this approach. Hopefully I'll do my share screen correctly here. And so this is what we built out in 2014. And this is a slide that we put in our first articles that we wrote. And so January of 2014 was the first time that we started to see this happening. It took us about 30 days uh, to figure out that it was the Russians, or at least we thought it was. But what they were doing was they were taking their playbook known as active measures from the Cold War, and they just updated it for the social media era, which was remarkable. They figured out like, how do we take an approach that did not work in traditional media and update it for social media. And it worked magically. I think they still to this day are, we just cannot believe it worked. Because during the Cold War, if you've watched the TV show, The Americans, right? That was a version of active measures, by the way, which is win through the force of politics rather than the politics of force, which is go into your adversary, start to shape their politics, and then elevate people that are sympathetic to your position uh, in such a way that they fight with each other so they don't fight with you. The other part of this is to break up any unions or alliances, because if you're the Russians, everyone's allied against you. And if you break those alliances one to one, you can start doing very well strategically uh, over time. Russia can overwhelm maybe Germany, uh, but cannot overwhelm NATO. So think of ways to essentially sully this idea of NATO, the European Union. Those are the allies there. And what holds all of that together, that's the United States. So what's interesting about this was we picked up on what you see on the right-hand side, which was this covert sort of action piece. And we called it, back then it was called trolls, honeypots, and hackers, but to keep three H's and be a Department of Defense descendant like I am, I, I went with three H's. But to understand this, the first accounts we came across were actually hackers. You might have remembered there was a group called the Syrian Electronic Army, and I talk about it in the book, and they were hitting key targets and hacking them, but they weren't, they weren't just stealing data and information, they were dropping it out in the open to essentially sully people's perceptions. Step, separately, we would run into what is known as honeypots, which are accounts that when you map them very closely, all overlapped with the hackers that were out there. And every time they did, uh, it was a lovely young lady that wanted to talk to you about politics or something, but hey, you've got to friend me and then I need to DM you something special, which would be usually some sort of malware. It was operated by the hackers. But alongside them were the hecklers. These are the trolls that would take whatever the information that was getting dropped out there and then start to influence the audience around these payloads. That essentially is chapter five of the book, which goes into how does this system come together? 
Separately, Russia has always maintained an, a very robust and advanced propaganda system, um, which is known as white or overt propaganda. And these outlets surfaced all the time in the network. So people would say, how do you know it's the Russians? They all look like American accounts. I'd be like, they share RT and Sputnik News and almost nothing else. What, what, what uh, accounts do you know that in the middle of the night want to talk to you about an RT article, you know, in the United States? Well, I mean, the tells are pretty obvious. And it's funny going back now, people, you know, we would brief this and they were like, oh, you don't know, you don't have any idea. And now they come back and they were like, yeah, everybody knew that. It's weird how this sort of changes over six to seven years as the data spills out. But in the middle is the key sauce, which is the connective tissue uh, of, of this whole system, which is, can you create a series of cutouts, conspiratorial outlets, uh, a series of individual accounts, which amplify or, or essentially take those secrets and turn them into narratives, which you can distribute around the system. What they were able to do, what the Russians were able to do was to combine hacking, and overt propaganda with influence from very shady accounts in such a way that if you sustain it over time, it works. The natural retort when I would show this in 2015 and 16, and the reason I testified to the Senate Intel Committee, I had briefed this over a dozen times probably in 2014, 15, and 16. And at the end, everybody would go, no one cares, this doesn't matter. No one, this tweet, they would pick one tweet, this tweet is stupid. And I, we would say to them, you know there's like 100,000 a day, right? This will come to the conclusion of the book here in a second, which is if you have to be persistent over time uh, with your messaging, your information. As soon as ISIS lost Iraq and Syria, as soon as their media battalion went down, their group faded. Whether they were successful on the ground or not, you just didn't know, but they start to fade from memory. Same thing with political campaigns that you see today is people are learning you never stop campaigning it's a perpetual campaign i think uh sydney blumenthal wrote a book uh 20 years ago that was essentially about this concept that eventually we reach a point where there's no end to the campaign and when i brief this to military folks they're always like all right let's do this uh you think 90 days is enough <laughs> and i go wait 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 like i don't know what you're talking about like you know, when did Coke and Pepsi quit advertising? And the answer is never, because they both know as soon as they quit advertising, whether or not the other advertising is successful, it's taking up the void. There's an availability information out there. And as soon as you stop messaging, you lose. And that'll be kind of towards the conclusion as well. What I wanted to show you was essentially how this plays out over time. So here's a case study. And I talk about this case study in the book, which is we had watched this for more than two years. I think we had about 7,000 accounts. It was J.M. Berger, uh, Andrew Weisberg, myself. And we did this out of hide. I, I wasted a ton of money just like trying to figure out how to do this stuff. And people were like, what tools were you using? I was like, we, we had this advanced tool called Microsoft Excel. And we would take like all the data and scrape it and put it into Excel. And then we would like look at it for hours and you would start to figure out these patterns. Um, and they would be like, well, how did you scrape it? And it was select all. And we put a weight on the space bar and come back in like an hour and it would copy all of it. Like we didn't have any advanced tools. So it took us a long time to get there. Today, you can do so much of this uh, almost automated. And you'll see a plethora of AI disinfo companies. There's tons of that sort of stuff out there now. But what was interesting about this is it started to reveal the things that matter. And this is chapter six, essentially, when I'm, I'm talking about the move to the election. The reason you could pick up on what the Russians were doing is once they won an audience, they didn't want to give up that audience and they moved from one topic to the other. It's just the way it goes. It's really hard. It's really hard to win an audience and keep them engaged across multiple topics over time. You would have to create sets of accounts around every single campaign and build audience from there. And it's just, it takes too long. It's too hard to do strategically. So it's a vulnerability, by the way, that you can always look at for if you want to counter this stuff. That tells you it takes time. You can't just set up the way the 90 days approach. You're not going to influence anybody in 90 days, which is why you'll watch them set up RT and Sputnik News for decades, right? That's a, that's a long run resource commitment to say, I'm going to go after audiences in this language. Um, this is the system to do it. When you watch what's going on, on this night, what was remarkable was uh, they operate like a boiler room with their troll factory. 
And they didn't realize that no one pays attention to news on Saturday night in the United States, even during election season. And so the accounts that we always watch was key monitoring group. They all started shooting out two stories almost simultaneously, this RT story and the funding news story. Separately, we create key monitoring list. All of the amplifiers that we always see would come in at the same time. And they would tend to talk about certain hashtags, Turkey, Interlink. And we took a screenshot of one of them there. Notice this is not that covert. He is wearing, his avatar is a CCP astronaut logo. So he, he is in the tank for Russia. This is not some big covert operation really. But he just says, I'm a patriotic Russian enthusiast that wants to amplify these things. What was also interesting is all of the tweets uh, at that time were consistent. And what did they do? They always talked about the same thing. American nukes are at Interlick. Maybe they're on the loose. There could be a second coup. There had been a coup there before. And they would bring up Benghazi out of context, which is weird because that's very American audience sort of centric. What happened next was we, we just took as much as we could scrape uh, in 78 minutes on that night uh, using our control all hold the space bar down and we just pulled all of the accounts and so i'll show you what is a very antique looking gif now but you know five six years ago is pretty pretty state of the art when you see the blue amplifiers come in we quickly noticed a pattern which is soon after you would see a burst essentially you'd see these burst each one of those bursts was a bot and we knew there were bots out there but we couldn't organize them very well we were we were having trouble organizing them so I'll try and show this with my marker. This is natural. These are people that naturally follow RT. You can see it's kind of almost circular in its pattern. Same for Sputnik, smaller audience, but you can tell. But around in time segments, time represented as this distance from the center, you would see these bursts. And what was interesting is when you downloaded all their bios, they all had the same common words for the green dots. God, military, Trump family, country, conservative, Christian, American, constitution. Boom, 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 boom. This is what a, the conclusion of the book will come to. They were trying to identify with the audience that they're trying to communicate with. We're like, ah, that's pretty damn smart. And if you went back and looked at their accounts from before, it would be something else. Like they just change them and update them. Pretty brilliant. In 2016, this was like pretty state of the art. The other thing that they did is they would push hashtags. And what's remarkable about the way the bots push hashtags is they tell you everything about the campaign. And it follows exactly the Russian system for messaging. Use calamitous, fear-based messaging. Why? If you scare an audience, they'll tend to take on information they would not otherwise believe. Nuclear, nuclear, nuclear. That scares people. It's calamitous messaging. Also, what does it do? It attracts media attention. What's the goal? Advance this story into the mainstream media. If they take it on from there, you have success. It didn't work on Saturday night because no one cared. They were all busy on Saturday night, July 30 or whatever it was, and no one was paying attention. Next, you tag the audience that you want to communicate with. Fourth, you give them the narrative in one word that you want them to remember. Benghazi, Benghazi, Benghazi. Inserlik is going to be the next Benghazi. So interestingly enough, I'm going to jump out of this presentation. I'll jump back in a second. Uh, interestingly enough, what was remarkable about this is it didn't work. And that's the only reason we were able to catch it and really sort of dive into it. And we wrote it up for the Daily Beast. Uh, I wrote the editor there. And I was like, hey, remember, I talked to him about this before. I was remember that weird stuff. I was like, the Russians are going after the election. We have a case study. Would you want it? And his answer was, hell yes. <laughs> he was like, bring it. It was like something totally new to him. And the story went out and we didn't hear a peep. No one cared. No one cared about it much at all. Um, they were super tied up in whatever WikiLeaks was dropping, which was happening about this time, you know, a couple of weeks later. This is Podesta emails, those sorts of things. And we have been tracking DC leaks and WikiLeaks and this. So that's chapter five to six. Um, and that's essentially like putting the pieces together, you know, in the book. So I'm going to stop share for a second just to set up, you know, sort of the conclusion, which is. All of this, you know, today, if I could say anything about it is, um, oh, I should, I should show you this. Okay. So it, it was funny for, for a period of about, gosh, I don't know, a year, year and a half, we, we got a lot of gruff from people. Um, then the Mueller committee came out and we were like, yeah, 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 whatever. Here are some of the hackers. They were on YouTube. They were, you know, training each other. There were different people there. These are some of the tweets and people would be like, 
that's from Benghazi, the campaign I showed you. And they were like, how did you know it was for Trump? I was like, literally the title of the accounts were for Trump. Like that's what they named. This was not like some covert, you know, opportunity. And then these are some of the Facebook accounts which were used to sort of place stories which came out in different indictments. So really fascinating to kind of see that confirmation. It took a couple of years to get there. Um, what was remarkable though, was as soon as it ended, you know, what I learned uh, going through and Audrey cut me off if I'm going too long, but what I learned in that period of like 2016 to 17, we wrote up, <laughs> we had, a, I talk about it in the book, it was a week before the election. Uh, it was a 50-50 time. We had presented this, this information to many, many different entities. We'd done public briefings, like, because they were supporting white supremacists at times and starting mobilizations around Jade Helm exercise. Through all of that, um, everyone was kind of in disbelief. And so I, I told the team, I said, we just wasted two and a half years. We need to write this up. And so we went to War on the Rocks and I knew Ryan Evans there as the editor. I said, hey, we got this thing we've been working on for two years. And if we don't do it before the election, everybody will think it's like some political sort of thing. So we stayed up and I think to this day, we're still the only release on a Sunday uh, from War on the Rocks. We did it. I said, it's gotta be a couple of days before. We released it, it was crickets. You know, there was some interest from the military community. I think they knew this was going on, you know, to a degree. And uh, yeah, I wouldn't hear anything until about Thanksgiving after election 2016. And that's when everyone was like, holy cow, I think the Russians were messing around in the election. <laughs> and this started this whole multi-year sort of journey, which is kind of chapter seven in the book. Uh, chapter eight, which I, I won't go into too much because it's going to be kind of the sequel, I think, to the book, but is my experience, you know, having worked in the government and, and ultimately what it was like trying to do any of the sort of counter messaging or, or deal with any of these things. And so it's been interesting. Um, I, I always think like, OK, the government's going to come around and they'll move to it and understand it. And they do at parts, but they usually try and fight the last battle. That's the tradition of national security in America. And so the Russians uh, are still doing this, but there are several things that have happened over time. And that is everyone is doing it. Um, and now when you're looking at it, this is the era that we call uh, advanced persistent manipulators. And so this is not in the book, this is kind of after the book, um, but, this is essentially how things work today. And this is what my teams do is we sort of track a series of actors all over the place. I wrote this up at the Alliance for Securing Democracy two or three years ago, maybe three years ago now, but it was after the book and I, I was writing some more. And this is very similar to advanced persistent threats in cyberspace, except for APTs are part of APMs sometimes, meaning hacking groups can be part of a larger collective that is advanced persistent manipulator. And they are actors, a combination of actors that are operating over an extended period of time trying to infiltrate and influence audiences and change their perception uh, around different activities. So much so that now the levers of power for all this reside only in a few places. For nation states, there's only really two that can do a full spectrum manipulation, Russia and China. They're the only authoritarian regimes that have enough capacity. Iran tries. And they do really, from their perspective, they do really well based on their resourcing. But they literally don't have enough people to type enough stuff every day to keep influencing audiences. They just, it's a resource limitation. It's a capability limitation. They don't have the tech. And if, you know, if I could relay anything kind of post book, it's that you know, Russia mastered the art and China will master the, tech, the science, the technology. It, it's really going to be this shift and the shift is happening right now. My teams work almost equally on China now as to Russia, um, just watching what they do. And they have different, different things they're better and worse at, um, but it, it is a powerful shift. And that really comes down to resources, manpower, audience access uh, over time, and the ability to sustain your narratives. This is the other thing. Uh, I'll hear a lot of people say, well, you need AI to detect the narratives. I'm like, no, you don't. I can tell you exactly what China's going to say today about any issue. And I don't really need to look at it. Um, Hamilton 68, uh, the Hamilton dashboard at the Alliance for Securing Democracy, just go to it on, on any day and you'll, you'll see what they're saying. If you want to track their covert accounts, they'll be saying the same thing. You have, to, you have to be consistent in your message. And so this gets lost because 
people like the spy spooky stuff. But ultimately, an actor that is only able to message covertly is only able to achieve tactically. You cannot sustain your narrative and influence people over time just by tweeting from false accounts. You can degrade things. You can play defense. You can create some opportunities, but you can't win from that approach. And that's kind of my next series of efforts that's coming out, you know, is about this sort of like the mystique of spy movies is to overtaking the American mind to think, oh, you know, it's this covert operation. No, it's just sustained propaganda with selective disinformation to help shape audiences to where you want them to go over time. So what's interesting is the APM model um, is essentially had advancements. And this is an older version. I put China as generation five. You can kind of see that in the book essentially follows that trajectory as it goes through. Russia essentially created a, a disinformation fusion center. They took hacking, combined it with false accounts, added propaganda, they brought it all together. But now what you see, especially in the modern day, is there are many firms out there that can provide some of the methods uh, that occur. And this one is a little bit outdated. I got a cooler one somewhere else, but I update this all the time, which is those that are most advanced are doing the most advanced things. And those include a mixture of the physical world and the virtual world, rewriting science around COVID, uh, creating fake histories of COVID, um, creating a think tank or nonprofit to advance the positions of those, all have a virtual world presence in social media. The synergy is there. ISIS understood that, take ground in Iraq, amplify successes, get more recruits, take more ground in Iraq. It's a feedback loop. Same for authoritarians and nation states today, or any sort of manipulator that's wealthy enough that can buy the levers of information and data, AI, media. If they can put all those pieces together uh, over time, um, it's a very powerful tool. Hence, in China, who did they go after? Jack Ma. One of the, you know, one, he's a media mogul. Why go after him quickly? Because he has the power to shape people's perceptions outside of their control. That's really where the battlefield is today. And it's coming out in what will be my second book, but I'm just going to put it on Substack. But as there's four levels to this, and, and the world is divided on those four levels, which is infrastructure, applications, content, and control. If you can do all four layers, you are infinitely more powerful than anybody else that challenges you. And that's China's system. China's system has tons of weaknesses, by the way, but from an information management, they, they have all four of those levers and Western democracies will never have the fourth one if they're true democracies. Um, that's why you see the sort of battle in our own country about straining towards authoritarianism because people wanna get that fourth layer, which is control. Um, the last thing I want to kind of address, and Audrey, how am I doing on time? Am I about right? Just go, just go ahead, Clint. This okay. is so interesting. Yeah, I, I was just going to kind of wrap up with, let me make sure I got the right one here. The takeaways for like people personally in, in terms of, you know, things to think about. And I actually did this at Substack afterwards because of COVID. And I was trying to like figure out a way to explain things to people. And I didn't have a good mechanism to do it. And they'll never read a whole book, right? Like you got to, you got to get them with an infographic and then hope they'll read 400 words. So the book, as you, if you've read it, you know, nine is essentially the conclusion, which is, okay, people go into preference bubbles. And this is what I didn't love about the Facebook hearing last week is, you, you know, the Facebook hearing was fine, it, but it's the same problems. We've talked them to death and the whistleblower is great. And she's super articulate. She, Frances, I think Hagen is her name and she was great and it's all great and nothing will happen from that. It will, it will go in one ear and out the other because we've had that hearing over and over again. And so what, Audrey, if, in the Q and A, if we want, we can talk kind of about, you know, the levers of power and like how we think about it as a country because it really all comes home as we've seen during COVID is, there are three biases that drive your preference bubble. The preference bubble produces three things, which I talk about in the book. Clickbait populism, which is essentially the more likes and, and retweets you accrue, the more followers you gain, the more you can set the message to your followers, which then creates an incentive structure that gives you more powerful and uh, more power in the information environment. What people then start to do is they see they lose followers, clicks, likes, or links, and they start censoring themselves. And so clickbait populism becomes sort of this artificial boom to where 
those with lots of followers, uh, likes and retweets are handed the reins of lots of power, whether they know anything or not, which goes to the second part, which is we divide based on an identity that's part real and part imagined into social media nations, which are defined much like we saw with the Russians there by hashtags, avatars, similar bios. And the weird thing is in the physical world, oftentimes you'll run into people that aren't near as grumpy or woke as their social media accounts. You'll be like, wow, this person isn't that much of a jerk or they're actually not that passionate about their social justice cause. They're really just at, on their couch. They both are on their couch. One's your uncle and one's your sister or brother or whatever it might be. And you become this imagined identity, but that imagined identity trans transforms into real social media nations over time that start to change the way the physical nation works and people become more allegiant to these virtual nations and physical ones. Lastly is the death of expertise. And we literally are crashing into the horizon of this right now with COVID, which is the belief that everybody who has a hookup to the internet is equally as smart as everybody else on the planet on any given topic, regardless of experience, education, or training. And so that is devastating. And that is our vaccine challenge right now and our COVID challenge, where people literally are dying in pursuit of their nation, their social media nation, uh, whether they are experts or not. And they are doing that, it, which is by choice, which is an interesting question about free information and democracies is, will we let people kill themselves um, to follow their belief system? And the answer is yes. But it's also rather tragic when you look at the other implications to everybody, you know, people making that personal choice. So if I can leave you with anything, uh, these are the last parts of the book, is how do you get into your preference bubble? It's three biases. And this is why I think the whole Facebook hysteria story is a little silly because they, Facebook cannot unwind any of these things. It has to be government that does it. So the first one is confirmation bias. You like things that you like. Facebook has a like button. When you press the like button, it delivers you more things they think you will like. Whether they're true or false, it doesn't matter. But that's confirmation bias. Social media is a confirmation bias machine by its design. You cannot undesign that. If you made social media that didn't produce things that people like, they wouldn't use it. So this is, this is a tension that cannot be resolved. The second one is implicit bias, which is people like information from people that look like them and talk like them. That is your social media tribe. It's going to be the preponderance of it is going to be people that are the same race or sex as you over time. And the distribution will sort of fall that way. It often comes from neighborhoods or tribes. It is your church group. It is your political party. It is your friends. It is your family. And it is very hard to break that cycle with an expert that you don't know. This is where the vaccine challenge comes in. And the last part is the availability. Those that produce the most content have the most content seen. This, if you look at the internet, the way it, it, it search engine optimization, all of these things sort of work is the availability of information gets processed and then put there, which has created things like news deserts, for example, where the Russians specifically go out and write news about something that doesn't exist so that they now own the space because there's no other available information to challenge it. It's a unique challenge for journalists in like Google news aggregator, Facebook ag aggregator. The second part is us as people, right? We tend to believe things and that there was a war propagandist from uh, World War II that I cited in the book. If, if you were a propagandist, if you've got four rules of thumb, these are your four rules of thumb. If you want to influence people, be first, be the thing they see the most, be a trusted source for them over time and remove and degrade any rebuttals to what your message is. First, most trusted, no rebuttal. That is social media. What do you see first? Social media. What do you see the most? Social media. Who do you see the most as your trusted source? It's your tribe. That's your, your social media nation. And then what rebuttal is there? You blocked it out already. Or your tribe is blocked it out. And so you don't hear it. And that's really the playbook, I think, for how we have to sort of move forward. And that's this is really the springboard of what I've moved to, both in terms of my own work and in terms of the what will be the second book, um, which will just be eight substacks that are exceptionally long that very few people will want to read uh, in the mainstream, but hopefully it could be like a, a useful for like education and class. And that's what I'll use it for. So Audrey, I went too long. I'm sorry about that, but. No, uh, no, that's fine. Um, I don't know. I hope you will also put the book out there. Cause uh, I mean, I'm going to read the substacks, but uh, some people need something in their hands, you know, Clint. So 
<laughs> but anyhow, <laughs> um, let me just, I don't want to be a geeky academic here, but as you've gone through your story about what happened in the Arab Spring and then, you know, various parts of the world, um, and oh, by the way, I, li I lived in Russia growing up. I was the daughter of the defense attache living in the American embassy, and I'm very familiar with active measures. <laughs> That's another story. Yeah, you, you've got uh, active measures times 10, I'm sure, because you were there. Oh, yeah, I got stories out the kazoo about mm -hmm. those days. And I actually feel like it's not, I mean, it is, a lot is new, but a lot is completely known and very familiar. But anyhow, um, my question, you've used the word populism. Okay, so I'm not, again, I'm not, I don't care what the definition is. I'm not trying to do semantics here. But it seems to me like we, we frame our thinking as being between democracies and authoritarian governments and, you know, populists tend to put authoritarian regimes into power in what sometimes were former democracies. So the, the way you've talked about populism in the Arab Spring is you seem to be defining it as a political cause that uses social media. I mean, is that is it that the technology has changed all of our framings? Yes. So. For example, whether it's Russia's approach when they're engaging foreign countries or a way to evaluate audiences today, I think there is no, no um, framing more worthless than Republican Democrat. If you watch like in the Democratic Party, it's Democratic populist versus Democratic establishment. In the Republican Party, it's Republican populist versus Republican establishment. So what the technology has done is taken uh, uh, any one of these political framings and turned it 45 degrees, you know, so that instead of everything being left right, it's either top down, bottom up. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's how the Russians target. So Russia, when it targets the US, right now goes real heavy to the populist right, uh, two thirds or one third of the populist left. And that is designed to push against the establishment because the establishment is what makes the alliances stay in place and challenges them. If you go to Mexico, they do the reverse. They go overwhelmingly uh, towards the political left in Mexico as populists to overtake the top. And what's their message? Well, the US is an imperialist power. You know, this is, that's traditional from the Cold War carried on. I see the same thing when I'm, I'm looking at sort of the social media discussion space on any issue. You could go, I'll give you an example, to Russia. It is Navalny populist, right, against the establishment Putin. If you go into the U.S., it's different versions of populist against what is known as the establishment. It could be the medical establishment. In fact, there was a certain political figure in the U.S. that gave it what I see is one of the most crazed speeches in, in a long time, talking about... Um, how we need to not take vaccines to overtake the medical establishment as if there's this one giant structure of the medical establishment. And you're like, well, there's kind of doctors. There's not like a president of the doctors, right? So this idea essentially though is of elite control. You'll hear these messages sort of come in pretty consistently, which is that power is not in my hands and I'm gonna use me, my friends, my peers and this technology to essentially overcome the levers of power that are being held against me. Sometimes that's right. I'm not, I also am not trying to make a judgment call against it. So like, sometimes it's totally right. Populist movements are what brought down fascists and authoritarians in different contexts, but populist movements will also have the ability to take down democracy and install fascists. It doesn't, it works in a, a very fluid way. So it's not one or the other. And I, I'm glad you brought that up, Audrey, because people often think I'm like anti-populist. I'm like, no, populism is like, what has made democracy thrive over time. But that's usually when they move from a position of advocating for the rights and their beliefs in a de democratic system to where they become part of the establishment over time. Mm -hmm. That's kind of how it works. Um, so it's, it's interesting to watch this, the populism comes about because of the connections provided through communication and technology. That's, that's what the difference is. And so I always, I always laugh that, you know, people, I, I spoke to the editorial boards of a bunch of newspapers and they were like, we got to restore trust in us. These people are calling the New York Times fake news. And I'm like, I'm from there and they've never read the New York Times. You don't need to worry about it, right? Like that's a false frame. Like true, they're maligning you, but they never read you before anyways. You know, it's more of a, it's a slogan. It's propaganda. It's not necessarily something that you need to correct against. Correct. Yeah, fact check better because you should, but 
don't do it because you're trying to win the trust of somebody who's never read your paper. Well, so it's not as if governments are separate from their institutions, though. And how do you strengthen institutions? Well, or even the press. So giving your example, the New York Times, um, that's an institution that seems to have borne up under this kind of uh, new environment, partly because they were already extraordinarily powerful and wealthy and a lot of the things things that you've described, but how about government institutions? Your book is pretty critical about how slow they are and how they're very yeah. unlikely to fight today's threats. And I totally understand what you were saying about the national security environment, but so how do you strengthen or do we want to strengthen those institutions? Do we need to create new institutions? How, what's the way forward? So when I released the book, I thought it was a catastrophe it would be sort of the binding agent, you know, that would lead us into that new place. But we had that with COVID and it didn't exactly work out that way. That comes down to shared consequence, um, which is essentially, you know, we did not have the same shared consequence and shared uh, experience of COVID that we did on 9-11. On 9-11, mm -hmm. we all watched it in our information environment. We saw it happen. In COVID, it was the inverse. We saw maybe some people died, we're not sure. It happened mostly in New York or mostly in Seattle, a couple of different places. We didn't see people actually die. There was no person that jumped off of a building. Uh, we actually self-censored that stuff out because we didn't want to traumatize people, which is good and bad, right? Like it's smart in terms of not traumatizing people, but because we didn't traumatize them, they didn't believe that this was something serious that they needed to take. And then separately, our, our politicians and elected leaders did not unite. And instead of trying to unite to support the institutions and bring them forward, actually actively work to dismantle them and break them in half. And I think that's where that can only be solved by elected leaders, that component of it. Separately, though, I do think there's a, another phenomenon going on. I'm not an expert in this, which is the, the new power or sort of like um, gravity towards state and local governance. And I feel it like where I live in New York, where I'm paying attention to that stuff more than I used to, because you started to realize, I think during COVID, how much governors matter, right? Like that was nationwide. I, I listened to a governor's talk about COVID, which was, I never would have done that, right? And I watched how different governors made decisions. Same with uh, local officials. And then I think you look at the election, uh, the Secretary of State of Georgia probably saved the U.S. election. If, they, if you could put it on one person, it was him, and, you know, with one speech at a podium. So you're starting to see like, wow, this is super important. That's where we need to sort of defend democracy, you know, going forward. It's, it's strange. Like, I, I'm not turning to the federal government anymore to solve the problems. But I do think across the country in certain places, you're seeing a not all, but in a lot of places you're seeing this, wow, man, I want my electricity to work in Texas um, and I want infrastructure. Those things take time to sort out, but I'm a little more optimistic that people are paying a little bit more attention to things that are closer to home for them. But doesn't that mean that the United States is going to become a government of 50 individual states like it was at the founding or even a government of 50 or millions of individual counties or cities I mean, aren't we fractionalizing what we really care about in our government if that's the answer there's three nations in america already it's just whether we seek to recognize it over time i i, I see it in pressing terms of, plant <laughs> I, I, i'm not trying to bum you up but also like these currents though it, it doesn't always mean that things will dissolve entirely you know like empires have risen and fallen, right? It, it doesn't have to, we have this sort of like movie version of like everything is Maximus and Rome, you know, and like storm in the cat. I, I don't think that because we're too lazy as Americans now, like things go very slowly, you know, and we have life really good and people kind of value that and understand it. But I do think people will make decisions over time um, and largely based on information that may or may not be true that starts to shift things dramatically. And the, the agent this time will be climate change. Climate change will be the one that mm -hmm. changes things in America. It'll take 30 years, 20 to 30 years. It's not gonna happen overnight. I think that's the other problem with like that Jake Gyllenhaal movie, which I loved and it was great. And they go to the New York library. I forget the climate change movie, what it's called, but that happened in like a week. It, it won't happen in a week. It'll happen in three decades. 
So, you know, it will be the generation that's born right now. They will be the ones that will fall into what the United States becomes. And it will be driven in part by these, you know, present currents in terms of information technology, but also by climate change will be uh, the game changer across everything. It, it will drive things over time. Um, I think in ways that are hard to imagine. And, and you're seeing people do that now. I mean, decisions around do I or do I not live in California with fires, um, flooding, uh, those sorts of actions. My parents and my family in Missouri are debating for the first time, should they leave due to intense heat? And they've lived there for 75 years. You can't brainwash them with social media about it. They're kind of like, it is crazy hot. Like it was never been this hot in 75 years and it's consistent. I think those sorts of things uh, will be dynamic. And I think things that were uh, international issues will dissolve into uh, local issues. There will be no such thing as immigration. It will just be migration. The only country that should build a wall on the Southern border right now is Canada. So, you know, like these things uh, over time, I think they're gonna be pretty, pretty ama amazing and not all bad. I, I don't think it will be all bad, you know, all right. Well, I, I don't know. I just keep wondering, what's the tipping point? You were talking about Gladwell. I mean, we've already had 700,000 people die to go back to your mm -hmm. COVID example. So why is it that people who are so heavily indoctrinated through this, this process that you've described well, why is it that they can see their next door neighbor die of COVID or even their relative die of COVID and still believe that there is no such thing as COVID or we should not get vaccinated? I mean, why is it not why aren't events actually affecting people? How do we de-radicalize people whose beliefs are so deeply ingrained now because of social media and technology and the various things you've described? I, you know, we, we have to do something for the people who are alive now, right? Yes. Yeah, and I do think, uh, you know, interesting enough, it was Bill Gates said a couple of years ago, he said, I feel like, he said something to the effect of, for the younger generation, the way they use technology, that there's gonna be a newer version of governance that emerges and they will be the pioneers of it, you know, that has more transparency due to technology, um, more democratic systems due to that. Um, but the challenge I think is uh, identity. There's like so many things wrapped up in this and Francis Fukuyama wrote a book two years ago called Identity. It's mm -hmm. one of the most helpful things for me in terms of um, my work in social media because he brings up social media in a very effective sort of historical way. Um, there was also an article, gosh, I want to say it's in the Atlantic or the New Yorker. I can't remember. Are they different? I think they are, but um, that's a joke for Literary Magazine. Um, but it was about the death of American identity. And I think that is at the crux of a lot of this is there is not agreement in the United States about what American identity is. And that plays to everything with uh, disinformation and propaganda. Right? What would we say to the world right now um, when we don't agree about who we are? Like that's ultimately what is the message, you know, that we're trying to deliver. Um, that's really tough. And for everybody to, and Fukuyama frames this much better. So please read his book, but um, you know, how do we have individual identity that everyone is personally proud of that still comes together as a collective identity that everyone's willing to fight for? That is a, like a big open question. I don't, I don't know that we'll, we'll be able to solve. So are we going in the opposite direction? I mean, it's all about yeah. identity. Are you in this category or that category? And, you know, this category has to be angry at that one. And that one has to be angry at this one. I mean, it's just a matter of dissolving into smaller bits how do we move forward toward a general identity from that? Yeah, so we should definitely get rid of Ancestry.com and 23andMe. So I wanted to bring this back to technology because this is part of yeah. this. Yeah. So like, I, I have people all the time say to me like, well, what's your heritage? And I'm like, I'm from Missouri. I don't know. Like I've done 23andMe, but I'm from, according to that, I'm from at least three continents or something and uh, at least seven different countries, which I have no emotional attachment to at all. And I've been to most of those countries and I'm like, I don't feel like I'm French or English or German, or I think it's North African, you know, like a, a little bit, but I don't know. But this is important because you're seeing people use that. Another one is Amazon that I always watch, which is I never, ever remember growing up in America and seeing people have a U.S. flag and a Swedish flag or a U.S. Yeah. Yep. Occasionally you'd see an Irish flag in an Irish bar, 
but oftentimes you still see him wearing like an American whatever, like Olympic something or whatever. Like just never thought about it. It's just like, okay, it's like one day where people drink too much and we eat potatoes or whatever. Like it was just like a holiday. And I didn't, I didn't spend any energy on it at all. And I felt no attachment to it. Um, my grandparents never talked about where they came from. And, one, and two of them came from Canada. And they, they never mentioned it at all. Today, that's very different. Like we're constantly reminded and due to technology of where we came from or what our identity is. I think there's a lot of good aspects to it. And that's people trying to seek purpose in life. Um, but it also is about the absence of the physical world, I think, to a degree, which is if you spend more time in this virtual world of identity, it becomes very hard to coalesce around a physical world of identity, which is really tough. I just felt like I was from O'Fallon, Missouri. I didn't really, I didn't know anything. I was totally unaware, no information, right? I was like, eh, okay. And I only thought about the US or America. And now people think differently. And I don't know that that's all bad. It's just like a current change that, that will be hard to put back in the bottle. Yeah, well, that is actually one of the questions we just got in. Can we survive as a country based on the individual and not the collective anymore? That's the, that's the big question, right, Clint? Not without a lot of robots, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> oh, heaven help us. All right. Um, well, there's another question here. Uh, it's about the relationship between disinformation and privacy. You want to say anything about privacy? Yeah. So the best crafted disinformation is attuned to your personal details and information. That's it. And that's kind of the what I was talking about, the super wealthy, right? They have the ability to aggregate all your data, know almost anything about you. Um, I mean, today I'm, I'm guilty of these things as well. So don't take them as criticisms, but they know our heart rate. They know our blood type. They know our ancestry. They know our music choices. This goes way beyond just like things we type on our phone. And so if you can put all of those pieces together, along with your movements and your geography, you can essentially write the system to where you're not being overtaken by a matrix. You've slowly volunteered for a matrix. And, and that is kind of like how it goes uh, over time. And it feels way better than real life as well. Uh, I think that's why you see people have this affinity for an identity in the virtual world. However, like watching this sort of unfold, it's like, how do we put privacy back in? And all of the systems uh, in cybersecurity, by the way, are better if they know quite a bit about you to keep you from losing your money or protecting you from threats. Yeah. So it is, it, it is a challenge. And then I think it always just comes down to how much do you trust the government that makes the rules around these things? How much do you trust the company um, that makes these terms and rules about it? I think one of the more interesting things that doesn't get talked about enough right now is Tim Cook versus Zuckerberg, right? The Apple, Facebook privacy sort of view will ultimately matter more um, than any of the other political debates we're probably talking about today, um, because they're making decisions about control, that fourth layer I was talking about, which is structure. And so when you put these two together, um, it, it is interesting that it's all about the oligarchs. And this will be a chapter in the future book, which is when we needed uh, to get a soccer team out of a cave in Thailand, no one asked the US to do it, they asked Elon Musk. This is a change in terms of the levers of power. This is a change in terms of your privacy and, and controls. We used to think, okay, and this is why I always laugh about the Snowden revelations is the US government is invading our privacy. I was like, well, they just sent subpoenas to eight places. That's it. Eight, pla eight places control all your privacy, but you're worried about 50 US senators or the FBI because they can throw me in jail. Well, what power do these technology companies have in terms of your privacy and the information they know about you? I don't know. I'm more scared of, of them because there is no real oversight. There is no rules about that. Your data is openly available to pretty much everybody over time if you use technology. So I don't have much hope that Congress will appropriately regulate it, but I do think consumers will start making choices um, based on how comfortable they feel with it. And the younger generation already does with Snapchat. You know, they, some of the applications they pick are more about connecting and, and getting information or having fun, but not disclosing everything. And so that'll be a consumer driven choice. I think the market may actually flush itself out over time. 
So do you think data is a matter of national security, that data should be more controlled by the US government? Uh, so no, mostly. Okay. Because, so it's, com I'm super complicated. I have complicated feelings about it. Mostly no, because I've worked in the US government. And I, I'm not really convinced that they would know how to handle it or it would be archaic or something goofy would happen. Um, but not because they're being irresponsible. And then there's a second layer, which is um, China, part of the reason they have such a decisive advantage over us is because data is uh, voluminous, uh, acquired, and openly used by all the comp technology companies. And they will yeah. pass us up on AI and most of the next generation of technology because they have all the data. And not only do they have all the data, they have four times as many people as we do. So it's the fuel which will power the science. Um, which will ultimately mean the U.S. will fall behind because that technology will be better. And if you don't believe that story, uh, I would bet you've got TikTok on your phone and you use Facebook less because they've already figured that out. You know, their, their algorithmic science is excellent. Um, they're learning quicker, you know, in terms of technology. They're keeping pace faster and they just have more engineers. They have more data. It's, a, it's where capitalism starts to backfire on America because capitalism is about scale ultimately. So I'm, I have mixed feelings about it. And I, I, do, I don't know enough about the discussions, but there's the discussions about protected data, which I think the Biden administration just passed. Yeah. So that we can do some of these things, uh, which have lots of advantages, but I'm not convinced you know, that it'll work. Huh. Well, you know, I can just hear some of my students, perhaps mythical person that would say to me, uh, you know, Apple and Facebook can't put us in jail. The U.S. government can. So why are you so, I mean, your feelings are more sophisticated than this, Clint, but getting to your argument before about should the United States have, the government have more data and, and what are the implications? I mean, how would you answer that person? Okay. That's if all tech companies are benevolent. But let's, yeah, okay. just, let's just go to the, the, the basic facts of it. If one of those large tech companies wants to make your life absolutely miserable or potentially put you in a position where you are vulnerable to legal action, they, you have given them all your information. And I'm sure they could arrange that if they so choose. And as the levers of government power weaken and as law enforcement and justice weaken, and I think the last four years, we've seen a lot of times where the Justice Department maybe was not so just, uh, they may very well have the power to do that. And if they can't do it in your country, should you step into another one, they might just be able to do that. I'm not saying any of the tech companies are doing this, but just imagine over time where you have a devolution of government authority kind of around the world and you land in one country or the other, or like we just saw with uh, Belarus, where they had a blogger uh, yeah. flying over another country and the plane was forced down to land. Things are going to get a little bit weird. And a lot of those countries operate more like companies or, or kleptocratic criminal regimes than they do as countries. And so our belief that the governments are all benevolent over time, I'm, I'm less convinced of it uh, overall. I, 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 like, yeah. I like to remind people Khashoggi was a U.S. journalist, uh, you know, a U.S. person journalist, and he traveled outside the country and he vanished and there's been no, nothing has happened uh, from that as of yet. So I don't have that trust that companies or certain companies over time wouldn't turn just as evil and operate in ways that we would not think they would behave and we have given them an awful lot of information financially you know personally medically uh, that is incredible power if they wanted to use it okay well yes i that's a daunting thought um so there's a question in here now from alina alamova who says you talked about identity on social media etc but what role does anonymity play that's a good question we didn't touch on yeah. that anonymity is a powerful lever of, as well isn't it it could be if you can build enough audience I, I think that's what was interesting in the early days of the internet right you had anonymous accounts and um, activists who created enormous change um i think i doubt the degree that anonymous entities online can be trusted over time now. The Russians abused that system when it was kind of wonderful, you know, in its infancy. The early days of the internet is someone comes out as an anonymous force and uh, writes a book or, you know, provides emails or sorts of internet traffic and the truth is revealed in newspapers. But that was the dream scenario. But now, like, the more we look, 
at any given day or week, I should say week, you go out, there's a leaks, hashtag something leaks, right? And I look at it and I go, hmm, I wonder who stands to gain from this. Rather than in the old default, I used to be like, somebody's trying to tell me something using anonymity important to bring justice to the world. It's harder to do now. I, I, it's harder to convince audiences, I think, to trust it. Um, they want to also have authenticity. And I think this is the transition from internet to social media and social media to people's expectations about identity today is anonymity was in its infancy, um, either a hacker trying to steal your stuff, right? Very small number or people trying to bring good to the world, but their voices were squelched. Now I worked on some early projects in Africa with that and they were super rewarding. I don't think we could execute it today. The technology, um, it can be surveilled in ways that people don't realize. Um, there are people out there that try and figure it out. And by and large, this is the social media influencer era, um, people want authenticity. And so the only way to do anonymity, I think today to where it could be believable is literally to be the uh, Zorro masked man, you know, masked person uh, who's a physical entity or human being that's delivering to the world, which is kind of that uh, that spooky show from around 2000 with Natalie Portman, um, uh, Vendetta, right? Like the idea is that it's a real human who's still anonymous, but you, you are the messenger and delivering and someone's attaching trust to you as a human entity. Yeah. Otherwise, I just know how skeptical I am and I'm probably quite a bit more jaded than the average citizen, but I think it's very hard to use anonymity for good in a way that is just like revealing information anymore because of it, how corrupted it's become by those that took advantage of it. Mm -hmm. That okay. by the way, is chapter five, where I kind of talk about the difference between the Mexican bloggers and WikiLeaks and some of the, the different anonymous entities out there. All right. Um, I have another question for you, but Nicholas Davis has come back in. So let's give him an opportunity. How can the United States hold U.S. groups that engage in active measures campaigns responsible or attempt to keep them from influencing the U.S. public, especially if they are based outside of the country? OK, so how do we go after entities outside the country that are doing active measures inside the United States? OK, yeah. good question. Um, it's three parts. There are institutions which have to make rules uh, that help in terms of undermining what was becoming active measures. The Honest Ads Act, very simple, still has not passed. That was put into place long ago for domestic actors to be have integrity. That would be number one. Uh, number two would be uh, assisting, in my opinion, in verification of more people. Right now, verification systems are largely for celebrity sort of like personalities or different standards around it, platforms would be better off to verify as many people as possible because it would add a degree of like, okay, is this a real person who really, re you could still keep uh, anonymity in place by the way, but you could verify that the real people they're speaking and can be held responsible for what they're doing. I think that's the key part. Um, other parts really just come down to the political parties themselves saying they won't partake in it. And, my last time I testified about this to the Commerce Committee, um, I remember walking out with one of the staffers and I was like, we were talking about the Honest Ads Act. And it was like, if it doesn't pass quick, they're all gonna be doing this to each other. <laughs> it was exactly right. Yeah. So part of the reason it works is because the political parties uh, use the benefits of foreign or domestic active measures type activity against each other. And as long as that, persist, it'll be very difficult to police. Separately, I think on the social media side is having a tighter um, linkage between social media companies, the big tech companies and uh, the law enforcement intelligence entities. And that sped up during 2020. And that's why they did much better. And so once the companies know what to watch and, and to platform, the better they do with it. And that happened kind of in election 2020. I think that will continue to improve. Um, separately is if the social media industry works together the way the banks or manufacturing work on cybersecurity. It's remarkable to me, like one platform knows a ton about a, a threat actor. Another one knows a lot about a threat actor. Another one knows, and they don't share information. So they shouldn't be competing on the integrity of social media. 
um, they should be working together. And I think if Facebook came along and worked with everybody else, uh, then it could happen. There's an information security association for every major sector inside the United States for cybersecurity. Should be the same thing for social media. They do that with the GIFT CT um, on counterterrorism signatures, but they don't do it on other malign actors uh, that are abusing different information environments. If they did, it would really squelch those actors over time. The APM sort of threats I talked about, they were simultaneously deplatformed or removed from the entire ecosystem. It would really send a downward signal to everybody to abide by terms of service. But there are downsides to each one of those, right? I mean, verification also enhances the ability to target, yeah. uh, like, you know, who someone is. And also these social media companies are competing with each other. They would all love to take down Facebook and grab the audience of Facebook, right? So how do you get beyond that structural competition? I don't know that. I don't feel like there is, I, I should jump to a slide. There's... Um, congruent competition for services. Almost each one of these companies has carved out a niche based on a certain mm -hmm. audience and kind of has a stranglehold. Um, Facebook, I, it's interesting. The best people to talk to about this are viral marketing firms. <laughs> if you go talk to social media influencers, you mention a platform, they'll tell you exactly who's on that platform. Mm -hmm. And the market share is minimal and everybody's competing for the youngest audience. Yeah. So in a lot of ways, I mean, out of the big five, you know, Facebook is for older conservatives. Instagram's for younger liberals. TikTok is for the youngest audience across the board, and it's more about entertainment. Twitter is for intellectual elites and political trolls. Um, they know this. YouTube is, you know, television with tons of different segments in it. And they, they know all of this internally and externally. I think it's fairly well known. So they could help each other out just by doing a few simple measures um, because no sophisticated actor is gonna operate solely on one social media platform today. Only the weakest manipulators do that. Um, if you're strong, you're on every platform. You're not on one. Okay, well, we're almost out of time. And I, it, folks, if you have one more question, send it in. But I'm going to switch to something that I was thinking about from the beginning of your talk, Clint, which was, you know, the, there's this effort to undermine the very heart of democracy, and it's been fairly successful, which is to undermine elections and the integrity of elections and the perception of the integrity of elections, right? So going back to the article that you wrote for War on the Rocks right before 2016, you know, I'm sure you've been asked this question a million times, but by explaining how the election had uh, foreign interference, that helps to undermine elections, right? I mean, it was also domestic yep. participants who were having their messages be promoted and, and manipulated. I mean, there's, it's a very complicated picture and there's nothing in this question that I'm wanting to accuse you in any way or put you on the defensive, but no, no, does, correct, doesn't this analysis correct. also undermine our democracy when we're, when we're talking about how all of our institutions, including our elections, are so, are so compromised? Yeah, it, in the same question of the hearing, I think it was March 30, you know, 2017, there was a question about why it worked. And it worked because Americans were willing to trade on each other to win. That's what it came down to. And I think at that point, I thought, oh, the more we reveal this stuff, because that's what they would tell you with active measures. You give it sunshine and you know it'll sort of disinfect or whatever. Instead, what happened was, instead of going down the road of being like, ah, we're not going to do this and let's just debate on issues. Instead, you saw political leaders double down on that and say, not only am I not gonna stop it, I'm going to continue to do it and I'm gonna get better at it internally so that I can win. And so that is one of the more interesting parts of this, I think. And it was probably about 2018, roughly when the book came out, you started to hear queries about how do I do this? Yeah. How, how can I do it? There are firms out there that literally just said, this isn't illegal, I'm going to do it. 
Like if you want to go at, against your business competitor, we can do that for you. So it's interesting because it's it literally comes down to the whole concept of the United States, which is if everybody pursues their self-interest, the sort of belief was whether it's capitalism or democracy and everybody pursues their interests, in the end, we all come together for the collective good and all ships rise. And today I can say without a doubt that in all cases, the pursuit of individual interest, at least in the information environment, is left to collective failure, you know, over time. It's kind of fall in the other direction. So, yeah, I feel like there was a point where I stopped talking about it too much, you know, in terms of what the Russians did because everybody else was doing it. By 2019, I was like, I don't think I'm going to beat on this too much. The Russians also shifted their tactics. They didn't write disinformation anymore. They literally just took American political disinformation and just recycled it back into the U.S. information environment. So they weren't leading anymore on that. Um, so I do worry that at the same point, every time you elevate it, I thought elevation would lead to mitigation, but it's led to amplification, I think, to a degree and in use. People recognize the tactic and, and they, they run with it. Well, okay, in your next book, I think you're already well into this, but um, let me just add another supportive comment that I hope you're gonna flesh out the answers. I hope you're going to talk more about the solutions that you've already laid out because if, if that's where we're going, then how can we get back to things like common truths under the constitution and beliefs in facts? As a, you know, as a higher education uh, educator, you really worry about when these, you know, the fundamental, the foundations of what it is that you teach are being attacked because everybody thinks everybody is about winning. Yeah, it is pretty remarkable. And I would note that a certain part of this political movement is about destroying that system that you're teaching about. That, that is the goal, is that you'll hear it spoken as the death of the administrative state, which is get rid of the state altogether. And then it's just every man for themselves, to, you know, almost pure Darwinism. And that's insanely dumb. I mean, no civilization has ever had it better than we do right now. It's like remarkable that people want to get rid of it. But that being said, I think that's the forces that are there and, and there are grievances that they have, you know, that they feel like aren't being met. I, that's why I think the, the local state phenomenon, local government, state government phenomenon is probably the most important at this point because the federal system has been debilitated to some degree. All right, well, we'll keep fighting and keep fighting for what we believe is the right thing to do, right? So one of the things I recommend that you and the audience do is read this book. It's a wonderful book and also watch for uh, Mr. Clint Watts's next book, which I'm going to be eagerly anticipating. Gosh, I hope you'll send out some um, notifications to all of us that follow. I will. It, and if I do it, if I just do it in a public fashion, the Substack Selected Wisdom, which uh, okay. my team and I, we, we, some of the graphics I showed you today are already up there, uh, but my team and I will be we'll push it out there in segments, so. Good, yeah, I've been following Selected Wisdom for quite a while, so I can't wait. All right, um, thank you so much, uh, Clint, for visiting with us here at the Center for Security Innovation and New Technology at American University. And uh, thank you, audience, for your questions. And also, this will be recorded, so there will be a lot uh, of other people who are members of our audience who will be watching this after the fact. There are classes going on right now at AU, so I do happen to know that there were a number of people that were very disappointed not to be in the live audience, but they will be in the recorded audience. So again, uh, Clint, you're doing wonderful work, and um, I thank you because I think you're doing the kind of work that we need in our country, and I wish you all the best. Thanks again. Thank you, Audrey. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Bye-bye.